All right, let's go back to the book of Revelation, to chapter 5, which I will read in its entirety. Before I do, I think there's only been one sermon that I've ever recommended from the pulpit, and I have more than once over the years. In fact, years and years ago, I actually printed out copies of it and left it in the back of the church to encourage people to read it. And it's called The Excellency of Jesus Christ by Jonathan Edwards. I would tell you to listen to it because now there are people on YouTube who read Edward's sermons so that you can hear them, right, instead of reading them. But as I was flipping through it this morning, it's over two hours long. So, A, you can be thankful that my sermons are only 50 minutes long. Uh, but B, listen to it in installments. It's a, it's a very fine, edifying sermon. And he goes after the, the paradox, really, of what I will be addressing today, and that is when John sees Jesus in the heavenly realm, what does he see? He, te he sees two things that are not compatible with each other. He sees a lion who is a lamb, or he sees a lamb who is a lion. He doesn't see them as the lion who once was a lamb. He sees a lion and a lamb. And he handles that, I think, extraordinarily. So the excellency of Jesus Christ, Jonathan Edwards, based on Revelation 5, 5, and 6. And now the word of the Lord. Then I saw in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll written within and on the back and sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. And I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, Weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scrolls and its seven seals. And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain with seven horns and with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne and when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song saying, worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe in language, and people, and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. Then I looked and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders, the voice of many angels numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who is slain 
to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying, to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. That's pretty much going to be the end of Revelation chapter 5 this morning. Because I'm going to do something a bit different. Part of it because of the health issues that accosted me during the week. But consistent with my bigger plan, I want to draw a line for you from Matthew 1 through 2, the record of the birth of David's greater son, Jesus, to Revelation chapter 5, where John sees sees the king in all of his glory. Well, to do that at all properly, we'd have to invest considerable time, I think in Matthew 5 through 7 at the very least, because there is where Jesus reveals the nature of his kingdom and the way of life that is to characterize its citizens. We won't do that. I've done that, I think I did that in a Bible study. We will make an ever so brief stop in Matthew 28 to confirm that in Matthew's telling of the story, Jesus indeed becomes what God intended him to become, of course, and that is the Messianic King. Then we'll spend a few weeks in Revelation chapter 5 as John enters into the heavenly realm and in effect says to us, if you could only see the things that I see, you would be encouraged. Your hands would be strengthened. Your knees would be made firm. Your hope would be reignited. And so we'll do that. And then we'll come back to the earth, as it were, and start in on First Peter and the series on First Peter, where we'll get a chance to see close up what Christian living in God's new kingdom looks like. And there we will find that Peter himself, the first apostle, who confessed that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of the living God, explains in some detail how severe suffering and heavenly glory coexist. Early on in his epistle, Peter says, in this, that is, in your new life, as transformed people in God's kingdom, in this you rejoice. Though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. Those conditions prevail in the earthly realm for the people who belong to Jesus Christ despite the fact, the fact that our Lord Jesus has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. So says 1 Peter 3, 21. Line those passages up place them next to each other, and meditate on them. This is one, I think, of a number of great paradoxes in the Christian religion. And what 
distinguishes it from all the so-called world religions, that on one side, or maybe it's better not to do it side by side, but above and below, above, there is our sovereign, human, divine, savior king. Yet below, what do we find? A weak, harassed, sinful, and suffering citizenry in his kingdom. This is the very problem that religion, by which I mean idolatry, was designed to solve. Getting the gods over on our side to keep us from harm and protect us from pain and distress. I would say that all the idolatrous religions and so many of the, the, the spontaneous beliefs that people hold so dear are committed to that end. Getting the God, the gods, the universe, whatever is out there, on our side, whatever we have to do to meet its or their demands, to keep us from harm and protect us from pain and distress. And here is the true religion breaking into the world and in effect saying, these two will continue to coexist. So we believers can either face this paradox head on and accept it by faith, right? It's not a leap of faith, it's a faith that responds to God's extensive and detailed explanation of the why and the when of it all, or, and I have, I think, a couple of choices here. If you, if you can't face this reality head on, we can go looking for and find plenty of false teachers who will provide a more palatable and widely acceptable form of Christianity. They're out there by the dozens. Humanly speaking, they're far more successful than I will ever be as a pastor. And I'm not discrediting all of the belief systems. That's not the point. But there is always that tendency to revert back to that fundamental distinction that religion, apart from the ordinary realm, is the realm in which we get the God on our side in order to protect us from the pain, the suffering, the harm, and the distresses of this world. Or we can do something else. Something that we've seen in this church over the years. We can simply refuse to accept the reality as we experience it now and abandon Christ altogether. Why? Because he lets us down so terribly. Much better and much wiser for us to hear John, who as far as we know, when he wrote the book of Revelation, was the last surviving apostle. Listen to how he refers to himself in chapter one Verse 9, as he speaks to the churches, I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus. I, John, your brother, I don't particularly like the word partner here, only because partner suggests uh, some type of either non-marital intimacy or a business relationship. Uh, NIV has companion, and I think companion is better. I'm in it with you, he's saying. 
I, John, your brother and partner, no, no, I, John, your brother and companion, where? In the tribulation and the kingdom. The tribulation and the kingdom, which calls for the patient endurance that are in Jesus. John was on the island called Patmos. Why? Because, because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. So a kingdom which over the last few weeks, as we saw, began in a manger under a murderous king where those most closely involved in the life of Jesus made a hasty exile into Egypt. That is the kingdom that John says for now is connected to tribulation and patient endurance. Well, you know how that story ended, right, in, in Matthew? How the kingdom came into existence. You'll recall Matthew's high note on which he closes his gospel, Matthew 28, 18, and Jesus came to the 11, he's on the mountain in Galilee. He said, meet me there before he even died, meet me there. And he said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And maybe we're to read that like this. And Jesus came to them and said, all authority in the now united heaven and earth has been given to me. That's as strong a statement of messianic kingship as you will find in the New Testament. Jesus had been obedient to his father to the lowest point imaginable, to a death by crucifixion. So his father, in turn, made the nations his heritage and the end of the earth his possession, Psalm 2.8. And if that's what Psalm 2.8 says, well, we need to see what it says immediately around it so we get the, the, the wider picture. I'll start in verse 7 of Psalm 2, which, of course, is referred to at Jesus' baptism. I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, the Father says to the Son, and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. You, my son, shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. So what should the nations take from this? Now therefore, O kings, be wise. Be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son lest he be angry and you perish in the way, for his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. So how blessed are we this morning that we've taken refuge in him, that we've come under his saving reign, that by entering into the safety of his kingdom, we will be delivered from his wrath. And since that day on the Galilean mountain, when Jesus ordered his disciples to disciple the nations, well, what have we seen? The earth has increasingly been transformed into the home of righteousness, right? Under Yahweh's anointed king, the kings have been shattered on the day of his wrath. That according to Psalm 110, Jesus the Lord executes judgment among the nations, filling them with corpses. He shatters chiefs over the wide earth until he pauses to drink from the brook by the way. Therefore, he will lift up 
his head. Paradise restored. Everywhere we look, Jesus himself is deciding disputes for many peoples. They are beating their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Yes? No? So Jesus is the king. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to him. But as that cynical question has it, yeah, how's that been working out for you? Not so well, if we're honest. I mean, if we're honest. And when we look at the beloved disciple John, probably 60 years or so after, his, after Jesus' ascension into heaven, where is he? On a volcanic, rocky island in exile. I thought about this just this week. Locally, one of the most well-known Christian figures in the area, since even before I came to Kansas City, I knew about this individual because of a Christianity Today cover article. He's been credibly revealed to be a false prophet and not surprisingly, he was using his supposed prophetic calling to um, gather a, a, a little harem of young women to be the special object of his prophetic attention. Meanwhile, the Pope in Rome decides that, yes, it's probably time for priests to start blessing same-sex unions. Does this sound like, these of course are just two little blips on the screen, but they're, they're typical of a world under the reign of Jesus Christ. Well, maybe things are better in the New Testament. Except if we were actually going through the book of Revelation, we couldn't find much consolation if we surveyed the seven churches that John writes to. Only two out of the seven are doing okay. The other five, collectively, tolerate false teachers. Five of the seven tolerate false teachers. They tolerate sexual immorality. And Laodicea especially, they've embraced the good life. I can imagine John calling Paul and saying, Paul, I've got this problem here in Western Asia. And Paul says, John, I'm up to here with the Corinthians. Call me back. It is not a good situation on the ground. And Jesus has all power and authority in both heaven and on earth. We'd forgive John there on Patmos if he experienced his own John the baptizer in prison crisis. I love that passage. It's in more than one gospel. But during the life of Jesus, this is from Matthew 11, when John heard in prison about the deeds of Christ, right, when John heard while he was in prison about the deeds of Christ, he sent word by his disciples and said to them, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? This is the same old story, a sinful and idolatrous people. God's prophet is exiled or imprisoned or worse by the ruling authorities, while the word of the Lord is seeking out a faithful remnant within the larger community of the covenant. And in the case of Revelation, 
It's not so much that he's coming to their rescue. It's that he has the authority to reward their perseverance. Otherwise, Revelation 2, 3, it's the same old, same old. It's like the movie Groundhog Day. We wake up every morning at 6 a.m. to Sonny and Cher singing, I got you, babe. When will this present evil age nightmare end? It seemed to have ended when Jesus said, all power in heaven and on earth has been given to me. All authority is the word. And now John is in exile. Five of the seven churches are in the Presbyterian Church, USA. Two of them are maybe in the PCA, probably in the EPC. Will it ever end? It's the same story. Except John on Patmos is not John in prison. There's no wobbling for this John. There's no stumbling. There's no nervous question. Jesus, is it you who has the authority or are you going to give it to someone else? I want you to go back to Revelation chapter 1. The next verse, verse 10. John, of course, is not writing from a Roman palace. He is, I think uh, it was F.F. F. Bruce who said he's not a cheerleader on the sidelines. He's in the thick of it with the people of God. He's on an island called Patmos because He's been an ambassador of Jesus. But he sees that the kingdom is characterized by tribulation, which requires, in turn, patience, endurance. And why isn't he just another John the Baptist? Verse 10, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. And there it is right there. I was in the spirit on the the Lord's Day. Now, ordinarily, the part of that verse that I'd most likely pick up on are those words, in the Spirit. And that would be well worth our time. But even those words, on the Lord's Day. Since the resurrection of Jesus, since the Lord's resurrection, there is now a day in the week called the Lord's Day. Called that at least by those who believe in the Lord. And that's the slightest indication that everything has changed. So nothing has changed, but everything has changed. And this is reinforced by the rest of the passage in Revelation chapter 1. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet saying, Write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me, and on turning I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man. One like a son of man. I, I know I've heard those words somewhere else. He's clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white, like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze refined in a furnace. And his voice 
was like the roar of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars. From his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun, shining in full strength. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last, and the living one. I died. And behold, I am alive forevermore. And look, I have the keys of death and Hades. I have authority over the realm of the dead. I visited it, and I've come out again, and I possess the keys. Write, therefore, the things that you have seen, those that are and those that are to take place after this. As for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. So there's one like a son of man, and he appears to John on that barren volcanic island, but he sure doesn't look like the Jesus that we all know and love. All the pictures that we've seen of Jesus never looks like this. Why not? Why does he look so weird and scary? What would a picture look like if someone attempted to draw it? Well, welcome to apocalyptic literature. Welcome to the book of Revelation, where the risen Lord reveals himself to his slaves through his apostle in what we might call a form of sign language. Now, fortunately for you, I possess the key that unlocks the symbols. Over 30 years ago now, I made a journey to the city of Beale, where I was inducted and made one of the seven masters of the arcane interpretive arts. Nah. Actually, the key for the symbols is, well, I'm not at Whitfield. The Old Testament. That's all. But the signs, these combined symbols in total, they signify something. Now, we don't have time to go through them all, and there are many, but I want to give you a sampling to give you an idea of what John is seeing and then, and then what it means. Daniel 7, verse 9, and then 13 through 14. This is Daniel speaking. As I looked... Thrones were placed, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was white as snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was fiery flames, its wheels were burning fire. Verse 13, and I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven there came one like a son of man. And he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages, right, chapter 5, should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. There's also wonderful passages in Daniel 10, 
that are either descriptive of some glorious angelic being or of the pre-incarnate Christ. But I want to jump over to three from Isaiah, 44, 6, 48, 12, 49, 2. Thus says Yahweh, the King of Israel, your Redeemer, Yahweh of hosts. This is Yahweh speaking. I am the first and the last. Besides me, there is no God. Listen to me, O Jacob, and Israel, whom I called. I am the first and I am the last. And the Greek text adds, into the ages or forever. And Yahweh's servant speaking in chapter 49, he made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand he hid me. He made me a polished arrow. In his quiver he hid me away. So what do these signs, these symbols add up to? What does this composite sketch stand for? You can picture it as if, as if an artist cut out photos from magazines and arranged them together in a collage to express some point that she was trying to make. What's the point? And I can develop that in just four simple points. Descriptions of Yahweh in the Old Testament now belong to the glorified Christ in the New Testament. This affirms in symbol form what is stated more directly, but not so frequently in the New Testament, that Jesus is indeed fully God. He is fully man and fully God, and the church is now a new Israel. So just as Israel regarded Yahweh, now the church regards Jesus in the same way. And though it would be fascinating to explore here at the level of symbolism, it's as if the Lord is in his temple, dressed as a priest. He is, of course, also the king. So, what does John do? He collapses. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. And that's typical of those who have come into the closest contact with God's glory in the Old Testament. And it follows a fascinating pattern. The end of Ezekiel chapter 8 and into chapter 2, We'll just go to halfway through verse 3. Such was the appearance, says Ezekiel, right? This is all apocalyptic. Of the likeness of the glory of Yahweh, he had just described it. And when I saw it, I fell on my face, and I heard the voice of one speaking, and he said to me, Son of man, stand on your feet, and I will speak with you. And as he spoke, spoke to me, the Spirit entered into me and set me on my feet, and I heard him speaking to me. And he said to me, Son of man, I send you to the people of Israel, to nations of rebels who have rebelled against me. Do you see the repetition there? The Ezekiel apocalyptic vision, which Ezekiel experiences, then has a heart attack. Then he's raised up, but he's not raised up as an end in itself. He's raised up because God is giving him a mission and he's equipping him with his Holy Spirit to go to the people and communicate my will to them. That's exactly what's happening in Revelation chapter 1. John, get up. I have something for you to do. So, Jesus Christ is fully man and fully God. Yes, that's our creed. But in Revelation, the church as the new Israel now regards Jesus as Israel regarded Yahweh. Second, Jesus the Lord 
has the same relationship with his church that Yahweh had with Israel. Now you may think you've just said the same thing twice, but in two different ways. But a point I want to make here is, go back to verse 5 in chapter 1. And from Je this is the communication from John. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, who one day will be rulers of the kings of the earth. Anyone read that? No, Bob says no. Maybe I have a funny translation, Bob. Or maybe I'm being rhetorical, because it doesn't say that. From Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, not the one who will one day rule them. This is exactly the situation of Israel. Everywhere in the Old Testament, it's understood by God's people that Yahweh rules the world. He created it for himself, and everything in it belongs to him. But yet, uniquely and distinctly, Yahweh rules Israel. And the kingdom of Israel is a redemptive kingdom made up of saints with its own priestly class, right? And its temple and all of those features. Those are two rules that exist simultaneously. Yes, in a Venn diagram, of course, there would be overlap but they are separate and distinct. And we mustn't confuse them because confusing them is confusing. So I'll stress again, Jesus will not one day off in an undefined future rule the earth's kings. That's not what Psalm 2 had said. Nor will I say, but for now he is content to rule over just his people. He rules the world, like all of those good Christmas songs, and he rules the world for the benefit of his people, whom he rules as their redemptive king. Thirdly, as the Ezekiel background suggests, and we didn't do other Old Testament backgrounds. John fills a role equivalent to Old Testament prophets. He even calls his book that, verse 3 of chapter 1. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. That would be me, actually. Because people didn't read it to themselves. Someone read it to the congregations. But... Blessed are those who hear, so you're in on it too. And who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. And so like his ancestors and the prophets, John has a spiritual vision in the language of apocalyptic. And like many prophets before him, he's commanded to write down what it is that he hears and sees. And finally, since the church fills a role equivalent to Israel, we are the true Israel, then we must be ready for the prophetic messages that come to us from the great king. He directs them to us as congregations, and yet our king is aware that what he writes to churches will not land exactly the same way on everyone who is in attendance. Thus the call to those who have ears to hear and their promises for a glorious future. The man that John saw on Patmos, the man that John saw on Patmos, that great king, was conceived in Mary's womb, born in a barn, 
placed in a manger, then without having the slightest inkling of the danger that he was in, his family whisked him off to Egypt to protect him from a murderous king. The man that John saw on Patmos is the man on the Galilean mountain who declared unequivocally that he had been given when people speak passively, they often mean that God is the one acting. God is the giver. He was given all authority in heaven and on earth, which freed him, which allowed him, which gave him the authority to command his disciples, go now and disciple the nations. And yet here we are, 60 years later, and one of those 11 men old and weary, was exiled to this desolate volcanic island. The new kingdom is just limping along with local congregations in that kingdom, the ones hearing from John, facing imminent judgment. The fire in the eyes, right? What kind of kingdom is this? What kind of king is this? And perhaps the strangest, yet the most to the point explanation we have in the New Testament comes to us in chapter five. And one of the elders said to me, weep no more Look, it's the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David. He's conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. John turns around to look. And what does he see? I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain. This is the paradox of paradoxes in the true Christian faith but to embrace it, to accept it, to look at it head on, is to embrace the living, glorious, reigning over all creation Christ, who purchased us with that blood and who now rules the world, even though there is nothing about our experience in it that would suggest he even rose from the dead. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, there is so much worship directed to you in the book of Revelation that that alone would testify that you are the divine king, that you are indeed fully and truly God, and yet, where have you come from? From the tribe of Judah and from the line of David. How do we hold all of these things together except by resting on your word and holding fast to the witness of scripture, and in this case, perhaps maybe especially the witness of your apostles so that we do not use our own lives, our own experiences, our own moods as a barometer to judge the way the world is, but to realize that it is the very nature of your kingdom that it's characterized by tribulation, that it calls forth our patient endurance. Peter will tell us that we shouldn't be surprised at the fiery trials that come upon us. And yet, how often are we surprised by them? As if the universe is out of order, as if there is no one steering the ship. And yet, all of these things happen for the sake of your church and for the glory of your name. So we thank you that your servant 
has entered into the heavenly realm so that we may see through his eyes something that human eyes would never see and how glorious and satisfying it is to us. May it remain in our hearts and minds. May we talk about it among ourselves for our mutual encouragement and edification. May you build up this knowledge in us so that those fiery trials, when they come, painful, distressing, unsettling as they are, will at least not surprise us. For we know that the God of our Father, uh, of our Lord Jesus Christ, is the God who sent his Son into this realm to be the Lamb that was slain. So bless us in our gathering, we pray, especially now as we turn to the Lord's table, where once again we're impressed by the revelation of Jesus that he is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And yet here we are worshiping Jesus Christ himself in his glorious heavenly habitation. Meet with us here, we pray. Forgive us our sins. Be patient with our weakness and fill us with hope and courage and encouragement, we pray. And we pray all of these things for the glory of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. As I mentioned in the course of the sermon. Whoops. Make sure this is on. That the Bible has, is filled with paradoxes where two things coexist together that simply do not belong together and should not overlap and occupy the same space. I'll remind you again of the excellency of Christ in Edward's sermon and the way he develops that is so edifying. But it's represented to us here that Yahweh, as it were, became incarnate in the world and took upon himself human flesh, human nature, and yet he didn't come to be served. He came to serve and to give up his life, a ransom for many. God can't die, but Jesus in his human nature experienced death as he tells us on the island, I died and I'm alive forevermore. Our minds can't embrace these things and so we tend to break in one direction or the other. We either break toward the dominion glory aspect or we break toward the retreat and hide away aspect. Such is not the case in the New Testament. Those two coexist together. Full participation in the world and its fallenness while recognizing that the characteristic of that life is a life of setback and suffering. I wish it were otherwise. My salary would probably be bigger because there'd be more of you, but it's not the truth. And Peter will tell us that. And so as we come to the table, let's face the paradox head on. See here the lion of the tribe of Judah from the root of Jesse, who is the lamb slain, in order that we might have the forgiveness of sins and that he might make us a kingdom and priest to our God. All of this is in its own way communicated here at the meal that Jesus left for us. If you are not a Christian this morning, then please don't come to the Lord's table because this is where the Lord interacts 
in a unique way with his own people. He separated the bread and the wine by his word. And he says that it's for us, for those who believe in him. If you want to know what it means to be a believer, then please speak to me or to one of the elders. But don't come to the table this morning. But to the rest of you, even in the tribulation and patient endurance that are characteristic of this kingdom, let's come and find a sense of life and fellowship with that risen Lord.